Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Elaine Kmark. I am a lecturer in public policy here at the Kennedy School, and I want to welcome you to tonight's forum. Uh, we will be joined sort of in the middle of this by David Gergen, who was in business uh, in New York on Kennedy School business this afternoon, and of course is flying around uh, trying to get here. Uh, the 3 o'clock didn't go, the 4 o'clock didn't go, so I think he'll kind of walk in here in the middle of this. In the meantime, we are here to celebrate a new book, you should go out and get it tonight, by Harvard Business School professor Rosabeth Moth, Moss Cantor, author of America the Principled, Six Opportunities for Being a Can-Do Nation Once Again, and to talk about presidential politics. Um, professor Cantor is the Ernest L. Arbuckle Professor of Business Administration at the Business School, where she specializes in strategy, innovation, and leadership for change. From 1989 to 92, she was editor of the Harvard Business Review. The Times of London named her one of the 50 most powerful women in the world. Accenture and Thinkers 50 Research honored her as one of the 50 most influential business thinkers in the world. I'm going to talk about this book in a moment, but first let me introduce my other panelist, who many of you know is former Congressman Jim Leach. He is the new director of the Institute of Politics here at the Kennedy School. He served as a Republican representative from Iowa for 30 years where he chaired the Banking and Financial Services Committee, the Subcommittee on Asian and Pacific Affairs, and the Congressional Executive Commission on China. He is best known for his Graham Leach Biley legislation, which is considered one of the seminal pieces of banking legislation in the 20th century. So I'm going to ask Rosabeth to say a couple words about her book and then ask Jim to comment. And what this book is, you, you really ought to read it, because it, the book, it's not often that a book has the spirit of the author jumping out of every page. This is a highly optimistic book. And, and I, Rosabeth's nature comes out in the book. It is enormously readable. Uh, you should give it for Christmas presents. Everybody's going to love it. And what she talks about here is, she really talks about America, and it's such, a, it's such a different way than we've been talking about America for the past seven or eight years with the highly partisan tone and, and the divisiveness. And she says, look, we've got six opportunities before us. Seizing innovation, getting the work-family balance right, something that women are always talking about, and it's so great to find a, a woman with the scholarly credentials like Rosabeth addressing this, encouraging good companies that go beyond the bottom line, restoring respect for government and the public sector. Those of us here at the Kennedy School can get on board on that one, that's for sure. Maybe we won't feel like poor cousins anymore. Um, engaging with the rest of the world in ways that maximize opportunity, and uniting in circles of generosity. These are six big ideas. She's got wonderful stories in the book and wonderful ways of thinking about them and wonderful things that we can do about them. And so I want to turn the floor over to her and hope that she will talk a little bit about the book, but also ask her, is there anybody in all of these 15, 16, 17, 18 presidential candidates, is there anybody who you think can do the things in this book? Well, they can do. First of all, they have to want to do. But I should first say thank you, Elaine. That was enormously generous <laughs> of you as an introduction. I'm just awed. And I should also say that the optimism you see shining through is something that I always thought was part of the American spirit and seemed to have disappeared in the last six or seven years. This 21st century has been a time of gloom. Um, and in fact, I often now say on platforms that instead of starting with the obligatory joke, I can't do that anymore because we've got a gross national comedy deficit. 
<laughs> and the reason for that isn't only because nothing's funny anymore, because reality has outrun it, and I will get to the candidate question, but also because there's been an apocalyptic thinking in America that's not only the stuff of tragedy, but it's the stuff of a certain religious fundamentalism. We were talking about that right before the program beca um, began because um, Congressman Leach asked me, you know, if the Lord is one of the candidates there. I said, <laughs> um, if maybe not running directly, but being invoked a lot. Well, so the, we have, have somehow let ourselves, whether it's because of certain um, people on the religious right or whether it's because the magnitude of the problem seems so great between terrorism, global recession in the early part, of the century, this new century, the sense that other countries are emerging that we don't quite understand, but whatever it is, maybe they're taking our jobs and it won't be good for us. And there's some truth. There's always truth to some of those. Those are challenges. But somehow, without the right leadership, we don't have the faith and confidence, the belief in ourselves to tackle those challenges. Um, so is any candidate speaking to this? Well, first of all, there's also another candidate not in the room besides the Lord, um, because one of the people I quote most often, I realized, as, I, as the index was being done, is Bill Clinton, which you know clearly makes his wife one of the people <laughs> who's coming closer to the agenda. But Bill Clinton could heal these times because of how he thinks about the world. So take one of the big issues, engaging with the world. Right now, we have... Uh, too much bifurcated thinking, dualistic, either-or kind of thinking about the world. It's coming from the administration, but it's also coming from the Harvard faculty. Clashes of civilizations. Give me a break. I mean, <laughs> whole civilizations are not clashing. There may be some differences here and there, but I'm a judge for something called the Purpose Prize which is being given to senior social entrepreneurs above the age of 60 who are trying to make the world a better place. In the first round in 2006, we gave a purpose prize to Daniel Pearl's father, so the Jewish father of the journalists murdered in Iraq, and a very good Muslim friend of his who were traveling around the country talking about their commonality. So Bill Clinton would always talk about what we have in common is much stronger than what divides us. What unites us is stronger than what divides us. And if we look for what unites us, we have a basis for dialogue about what divides us so we can move forward. But the idea that you have to make choices, are you for us or against us, enemies or not, we need more nuanced thinking. And whether So on bits and pieces, some of the candidates reflect that. But it has been such a trap at this point in the campaigns to have two big issues be talked about again and again. What's, what's the Iraq policy or the exit strategy? And what's your health care plan? And therefore, many of the other issues that I talk about in this book and that are on the minds of the American public are simply not being talked about. Although I do think that both the Obama campaigns and the Clinton campaigns are trying to address to address some of them. But there's a whole set of other issues about how we work together as a nation. Um, I think that I do think that candidates who are coming from a more progressive tradition reflect the things that will help us in the future. It isn't going to help us in the future to um, assume, A, that government's the enemy, and that the only important thing about government is that they confiscate our money, and we want it back. I mean, as our current governor in Massachusetts said in the campaign, and maybe he said it even here one day um, when his opponent said, but it's your money, the tax money, he said, yes, and it's also your schools, your roads, your bridges, and there's a whole variety of public assets that we share in common that we need to value. So I would say those candidates who actually respect the offices that they're running for are important candidates on the progressive side because we've had too many years of people running 
to be in public office who are ending up trashing it, saying we want less of it. You were part of reinventing government. And what was great about reinventing government in the 90s was that it made government leaner while being more effective and while respecting the basic functions. So what I'm really arguing in this book is if we go back to root American principles and create a coherent agenda that runs through all sorts of policy choices, so it's not who has the best health care plan. You know, whoever is elected is not going to be able to implement their health care plan unless lots of other constituencies also agree with it. So you better have a set of coherent principles about why. You better have a rationale for uniting the people behind it. And so far, while I lean toward um, the Clinton and Obama perspectives, I think candidates are not providing a coherent agenda for America. It's an ad hoc set of sound bites or program by program or personality by personality values. And I don't think that's what the American people want anymore. It's, you cannot be elected just by being not Bush. Hi, but you can be elected by being David Gergen's friend <laughs> and <laughs> arriving at this meeting. Hello, David. Welcome. Um, I think people are looking for something that's, that is not apocalyptic, that says the world is not ending. There are things we can do to, to save American jobs without protectionism. There are things we can do to have vibrant economies here while also and protect people from transitions <coughs> while also embracing globalization. There are things we can do to do service in our communities, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, because we all care about the community. There are things we can do to install what I call real family values, because real family values are not the government looking at what you do in the bedroom and with whom, but then I'm from Massachusetts, what do I know? <laughs> but real family values are values that allow people to have family life while still earning a living. I think those are fundamental things people care about and that we need an overall agenda. So that's not quite, you know, naming the name of my favorite candidates and their bits and pieces, lots of places. But I do know that end of the world apocalyptic thinking isn't going to work, that bashing other countries as though they are totally our enemies with no nuance, and I hope we get to that foreign mm -hmm. policy issue later, doesn't, won't work. I know that um, arguing that we should put constraints on people's private conduct because some people are more moral than others and have the God test or the religion test doesn't work, won't work. People won't stand for it. And that what we need for moving forward is investments in science and technology is policies for the workplace that reflect the digital age, not the machine age, that we need respect for public service or we'll get what we pay for or vote for, which is people who don't believe in it and who aren't there when there's a disaster or the bridges fall down in Minnesota. I mean, Minnesota of all places, which I right. thought of as the state that should invest in infrastructure because they actually believe in the public sector. Their bridges are falling down, but we've got to change that climate, and we can, because everything I talk about in the book is happening somewhere in America. We just need to take it to scale nationally. Great. Congressman? Well, first, I, I, I want to recommend this book. It's a fine book, uh, and possibly because because the question that was asked you, uh, I, I wasn't sure you really totally reflected the book. And let me explain what I mean. Uh, and I didn't differ greatly with anything you said. But uh, This book is amazingly positive, but one of the things that I think it does is that it takes it out of the context of a political campaign. Uh, that there is an issue of leadership, but uh, there is this, this thing in the world when you read the newspapers, whether it be international or domestic, uh, that might say China held today, the United States today is doing this. Well, actually, that usually means the government. And if you take society or civilization, whichever way you want to think of it, we are a society, and it's a society of which government's a little part. And it's many more things. Uh, and what Elaine has written about, excuse me, 
uh, Roosevelt, I, I wish I had What Roosevelt <laughs> is written about is the responsibility of American civilization, uh, and that it's unrelated to a campaign. And one of my favorite sentences, and I'd, I'd like to just read this to you, it, it reads, uh, I think that a combination of trade spawn business networks and grassroots citizen diplomacy is our best hope. And what's interesting about that statement is that there was a day that relationships between countries were government to government. Now we really have relationships between societies. And with the exception of the war peace issue, which after all is pretty tremendous, particularly when there is a time of war, business relations are more consequential today. Cultural relations are more consequential. So this notion of citizen diplomacy, and what is citizen diplomacy? It's, it's Americans interacting with other Americans. And they are Americans that might be a high school kid, might be a professor, might be a businessman, might be a violinist, might be a writer. These are far more important in international relations than some government to government relationships, at least once we get out of a war setting. And that is the real responsibility of government. Uh, and I think you've got this exactly right, Rosebeth. Now when it comes back to campaigns, I'd only add one thing, and I'm coming a little bit of a Republican perspective. Yeah, I, was a public I think Rosebeth is, is right when she kind of nails my political party on a little bit of a fear dimension, which has gotten augmented into some tough words, and language is important because sticks and stones hurt, but words can hurt more in many settings. Uh, but if you really think about it, there are several kinds of fear. One is the political fear that I think the Republican Party ought to really rethink its strategies on. But if you look at the campaigns, the Democratic Party is, is setting forth some economic fears, which you have combated here. But for example, we're very, very close to a new round of protectionism in the world. And protectionism can have some economic fall-offs like contraction of economies that can have some political spin-offs like war. When we think of World War II disproportionately, and we, we think of Europe, and we think of fascism, and all the awful implications of Adolf Hitler. But remember, when we look to the West, war was spawned probably, even though it was a quasi-fascist state in Japan, was spawned more because of trade than other things. And if we get a policy dimension going at the governmental level that is anti-trade, we're gonna have real dilemmas in our society. So all I would say is government is important. This new leadership debate is terribly important, uh, but no one is reflecting in totality the themes of this book. Uh, and I would say the Democrats are doing a better job on politics. The Republicans a slightly better job in economics uh, if you don't look at deficits. And, if, and, 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 and if you forget the word fairness. I mean, I, I don't want anyone to think fairness should be applied. But on, on trade, it's a little better setting than, than, than might be suspected. Great. David, would you like to chime in? Thank sure. you. I'm glad US Air got you here finally. Sure. Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry I was late. I was in New York trying to convince someone to, that uh, what an opportunity he had to invest in the Kennedy School uh, <laughs> and uh, how principled he would be if he did that. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I'm, uh, it, it took a little longer getting back than they expected. The, I, I do want to say, uh, and not only uh, thank Roosevelt, Roosevelt for being here, you should know that her head may be over at the business school, but frequently her heart is over here at the Kennedy That's School. True. That's uh, true. And uh, she, we, we, she's always welcome here at our forums, and she's been in many of them. Uh, and I, I must say, just in one other prefatory remark, that this weekend I was reading uh, a book by Marion Wright Edelman that she wrote a number of years ago of letters to her children, and came across a passage which I was quite struck by and, and, and as a, on the eve of this gathering, talking about the Congressman Jim Leach. And, uh, and said quite specifically in very pointed way that he was one of the few people in Congress who really stood up for a principled America. And I, 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 I thought it was, and this was written maybe 15, 20 years ago. Do you remember that book? You probably don't even know you're in there in a very prominent way. <laughs> no, I don't. Yeah. I admire her very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure your admiration for her just went up. Now, uh, 
I want to come back uh, to one issue that both Rosabeth and Elaine have written about, and Elaine's recent book, most recent book, uh, is about reinventing government, and both of them cite that, and I hope we can explore that here, because I think it's so relevant to a school of government and to people who are thinking about how they might fit into government service, how we could uh, uh, find a more, uh, more positive way to approach and uh, in reforming government in a way that would make it more attractive to bring in the really talented people to kind of go here to this school. But before we get there, I must say, Rosabeth, the one issue that I'm struggling with is about whether, in fact, you get people to move and change their patterns by appealing to the positive or whether you sometimes have to scare them. And I say that with particular reference that only a few hours ago when Al Gore went to Oslo to accept his Nobel Prize, he gave a, you know, his talk was really about the cataclysmic impact that, that our current course on the environment may take us. And it was, it was really about how to scare people into doing something. And so can you, can you get the kind of sacrifice, and Elaine, you've worked with it, can you get the kind of sacrifice that is required from people, to say, to pay a carbon tax, unless you present the notion that a John Holdren represents, and other scientists represent, that we've already done, that, that damage to our society, to the environment is already built in. The real issue is whether we can avoid uh, you know, a catastrophe. That's the serious issue, and that's what gets people's attention. I'm just trying to figure out, because you know, you know, when I pick up a John Cotter's book, for example, Rosabeth out of the business school, he talks about organizational change, and he argues you have to create a burning platform. Mm -hmm. You have to create a sense that we're going to sink. You know, Cotter writes a book, you know, about peng penguins, our ice is melting. That's the only way you can get them to shake them out of their complacency. So I'm, I'm interested in this notion about appealing to people's hopes versus a, scaring them in order to make big change. I think, David, that's a great question. I also want to come back to some things that Congressman Leach said, which were also very profound. It's a great question. And I think the answer is you tell them the truth. So sometimes when we say let's appeal to people's hopes, that means pandering by telling people what they want to hear, like there's no problem out there, um, everything can be perfect. That's not the kind of optimism I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The kind of optimism I'm talking about begins with the facts. You lay out the facts, but you also have to have an image of a better world there because that's not what apocalyptic thinking does. Apocalyptic th thinking says, it's the end of the world no matter what we do, so why bother? Who needs to fix the environment if Armageddon is going to come in 10 years anyway? But if you lay out the truth, and that's one of the things I fault this administration for, is that they have not let scientific facts speak for themselves, or at, less, or at least have the debate where yeah. the debate needs to be, but also behind that has to be a sense not just of hand wringing, but that there's something that can be done. Because if you start only with the hand wringing, with the fear, people are paralyzed. And that's when oligarchs and demagogues take over. Because then they say, OK, you're afraid, you're scared, nothing can be done. And so let us make all the decisions centrally. And you let yourself be strip searched at an airport and take off your shoes, even though no other country do you have to take off your shoes except here. <laughs> um, you know, you let yourself get subject to stupid rules because you're so paralyzed because you don't see the way out. So I think change comes because you definitely have to lay out the brutal facts, whatever they are, face the facts. But without an image of what might be possible, the demonstrations, the mm the examples that, in fact, you could reverse some of these trends, then I think all you'll have is a bunch of people who aren't going to want to hear the facts anymore. I, I want to just take, I know we might want to have some debate about that, but I just want to go back to something you said, though, just so I don't forget it. Because on this question of whether it's about reinventing government or something else, you are right. I wasn't true to the book in one way, and that's because I haven't read it for a while, I must say. Um, no, and that is that one of the arguments here and one of the new, the 21st century principle that actually goes back to a root American founding principle is the power of the citizen. When de Tocqueville visited America in 1829, he did not 
devote many chapters to um, the federal government. He spent time on social entrepreneurship community by community. He spent time on citizens and what citizens did to make a difference. Now, we do need the federal government to scale up fantastic things like City Year and Teach for America and get them everywhere, but it often is citizens. And that's where the Democratic Party, by the way, has to get out of government does it all and, and support social entrepreneurship. And it's where the Republicans, though, go a little too far sometimes by saying, well, it's all volunteers, and isn't it a 1,000 points of light? And I say, I love those 1,000 points of light, 2,000, 5,000 points of light. The more points of light, the better. But if you don't have an infrastructure to focus them like a laser beam on problems, all the volunteerism in America doesn't add up to change. So it's a combination of, big pu of, of public investments with private entrepreneurial citizen spirit that make a difference. And the question of hope versus fear, well, as I say, fear, that, that's really a great question, David. The question of how much the platform has to be burning, how you shake people out of complacency. What social entrepreneurs are learning is that an awful lot of people are motivated by hope to get working because hope feels better. Um, it's more positive. In fact, at this moment, when all the national happiness studies show that we're well behind Ireland and Costa Rica, um, in, in what? In happiness. In happiness. happiness. <laughs> um, Wouldn't you? That's, why, why is that hard not to? Why, hard, hard not to understand. Is, is, why, I would think better Costa climate, Rica would be happier. Yeah, why, why should they be happier? Better climate in Costa Rica. But the point like is, that I was just going to say that was like the throwaway yeah, lead yeah. into the happiest people I know are social entrepreneurs, the innovators who say every day, I'm making a little difference here, a little difference there. They feel they're doing something. And so it's that feeling of being able to do something. We don't have to cower in fear while we wait for Homeland Security to figure it out. <laughs> we can do something. Jim, did you want to, um, did you want to, I saw you making notes there. Did you want to respond? Well, I, I, I just don't think this audience should be misled into thinking that de Tocqueville talked about social entrepreneurship. <laughs> uh, this is a Harvard Business School, Harvard Kennedy School conceptualization, and it's a wonderful one. But he, he really respected the individual and individual initiative. Uh, no, no, no. I actually well, disagree. Okay, okay. Jump in. I actually disagree. De Tocqueville also talked about volunteers and okay. individuals forming associations yes. and going off to, you know, when their neighbors, uh, you know, farm burned, you know, word? barn the fell words. in. Did he use it? social entrepreneurship? No. He didn't say so. He didn't. Nobody was French, and he would have if he <laughs> thought of it. <laughs> he said, I have the quote here, something about, yeah, people forming. He said that was the striking thing about America. It was everywhere people seemed to be forming associations and passionate resolves. That's right. Well, and of course, that's the big thing that differentiates us from Europe. We vote less, but we participate more. So we, we turn out to vote less, but in fact, we, find, we, we feel self-empowered yeah, yeah. to go out and but, do But things. let me ask you this question. I, I did find it interesting. I mean, it's really striking. And when you look at Al Gore and Bill Clinton, Al Gore argues about the environment, about the catastrophe. Bill Clinton is now saying, making a, you know, is passionate about how many jobs we'll create if we take on global warming yeah. and how, how much of a return you know, that will come. It's an interesting contrast yeah. between two political figures right. Right. about how to approach the same problem. How to approach the same right. problem, right. right. And, and of course, that's, that's where Clinton is such a great you know, a politician, is that Clinton always knows how to make the direct link to right. people in, in a way that people really, people really get and people really get into. Um, and that was always Clinton's gift. And I agree with Rosabeth that I think that he would be a, a very good person to, to, to pull some of these together. But I want to actually bring it into the 08, because some of you were lured here with the promise that we talk about presidential politics. And I want to ask Jim or David, do you think there's any Republicans who embody some of these principles? I mean, I can name some, and I'm not in, I'm not in the habit of being nice to Republicans, so I sure. thought I would let you guys do it. <laughs> well, Mike Huckabee thinks we can all go to heaven. Okay, but do you think, but David, do you think Mike Huckabee has this sense of optimism and the can-do that Rosabeth argues for in this book? Let me, let me 
comment on that briefly. Yeah. Uh, we're all just getting to know this character named Mike Huckabee. <laughs> uh, he, in the debates, he's the one Republican candidate that's showing some compassion. And it's a very interesting phenomenon. I mean, when mm -hmm. asked about his role as governor of Arkansas and allowing uh, the, the children of illegal immigrants to go to school, yes. he says you don't punish the children. It was uh, and, a and, and, that, and that was very different response, than yeah. the other concepts. Uh, in addition, he's being attacked for raising taxes in Arkansas, a state that uh, under uh, at least the governorship of one of your heroes uh, was not a very progressive state. And Mike Huckabee as a Republican made it a substantially more progressive state, dealing far more seriously with the problems of Arkansas. And that ends up having some disadvantages in the Republican primary. Uh, and Mike Huckabee as an individual appears to be a, an, uh, someone who has a, a sense for people. Uh, and it's impressive. Mm -hmm. Now whether one agrees with his background uh, in what he said and some other issues, uh, that's another very different matter. I mean, he, he, he does have a quote out about um, quarantine people with AIDS in 1992 that is not very impressive. Uh, but there are aspects of his background that I think we're all getting to, to see. Uh, we had a governor here of Massachusetts who was a progressive governor of Massachusetts. Uh, and whether he chooses to run on that progressive background or not is, is uh, mm -hmm. uh, a matter for, for parties to deal with. Uh, but I think the Republican Party has uh, uh, some candidates who are, who are decent and, and uh, should be respected by the American public. Well, and it, it, I mean, just from what I've seen of the Republican debates, it seems to me that your belief in the vibrancy of the private sector is very much more prevalent in some of the Republican debates than it is among the Democrats. David? I, uh, uh, I think we're in an extraordinarily volatile time, and this is a much more unpredictable race than anyone would have imagined on both parties uh, a few months ago. Uh, you know, so I don't think it's possible to uh, to and forecast. And there's a third party coming. And there may be a third party coming, uh, or a third party candidate coming. I'm not sure it's a party, but we may have a Bloomberg and Bloomberg. I think people have been talking to me this weekend about a Bloomberg nun ticket that might emerge. Uh, and uh, if this were all uh, to, you know, and, and there's some talk about them talking to each other. Um, and I must confess, I'm a, I did not see the Mike Huckabee. Candidacy blooming, and, and and it's been part of my almost mystification. I think people are shopping, in effect, and I think they have a hard time landing somewhere and finding out. Oh, this is what I really want, and so their their feelings are lightly held, and they're moving around, you know. And then they stop for a while on a Fred Thompson, and then say, "I get not no, I don't think so. that's the right one." He's still in the lounge chair. Let's not like that, you know. And so there, and I think there's there, there's very little sense of commitment to any one of these candidates. Uh, my own feeling is that Mike Huckabee may win Iowa, but if he does, it's really going to help Giuliani more than anybody else, because it it it, it could really take the air out of uh, uh, Romney's uh, campaign. And once that happens, I think Giuliani's in a stronger position to win. It's it's unimaginable to me, but I guess it could happen that Mike Huckabee will be our next president. I just don't. I do think he's the more authentic. I think he's more uh, compassionate, as Jim Leach just said. But when you look at the totality of his positions and his experience, I just, it just seems to me people are not going to, they may, they may flirt with him, he's a great first date, but I'm not sure it's going to go to a second <laughs> or third date. Um, uh, and uh, after that, when you look at the Giuliani Romney campaign, what is, and I think they're really the two people who are going to duke it out, um, my concern is that they do have a dark view of the future, and they are running a campaign based to a very large extent upon fear. It's either fear of immigrants or it's the fear of Iran or maybe another issue. And I don't think that provides them with a foundation for a positive platform for change. And the one thing we know about a party that still looks to Reagan uh, as its model is that Reagan was a man of contagious optimism. And he was very much fit this mold of, a, you know, we can do. We can. He believed, uh, partly because he had seen, you know, he grew up as a young man watching the country get knocked down twice, 
first in the Depression, and then again in Pearl Harbor and the d defeats that followed in the Pacific. And more importantly than seeing us knocked down was the fact he saw us get back up again. And that's what gave him, and a lot of people in that generation, a, an inner confidence about our resilience, our capacity to respond, our capacity to do things, and that World War II generation really, really was a can-do generation. I and think you they don't that see typified. This in a Giuliani or I don't a see that. I think that Giuliani will tell you, and I think because I think he's earned it. I, you know, he was a person with our innovations in American government program. It's here at the Ash Institute now. We honored him several times for you know Comstat, Comstat. some other things. You know him for reinventing government, uh, and he did a number of things as mayor of New York, which were innovative, the kind that Roosevelt, but has talks about in her book. But his campaign is largely based on one of fear, and I think the Republicans have won on that. Yeah, I have Couple kind times. of a, a Republican that, not, that hasn't been mentioned yet, but I also want to just comment on our so-called progressive governor of Massachusetts. Um, one of the, because this really bothers me, I mean, I use the word principles in the title, we're talking about who are principled leaders. I think I'd rather have somebody that I know where they stand than somebody who stands for nothing, um, because then I don't know what they'll do when unexpected events occur, and that, Aside from all the other things that are um, Rom baggage Romney is carrying around, that bothers me. And also, I don't think one becomes the can-do candidate just by declaring, hey, I'm the most optimistic in the race. I mean, everybody's read the studies that say the most optimistic candidate is likely to win. But that's not based on self-declaration. It's based on saying something real. Um, so it was very interesting to hear what both of you said and what you said about both of David, about both of those campaigns, Giuliani and Romney, being based heavily on fear. I think, I mean, this is one, my one piece of, then I'll get to the candidate, but my one piece of inflammatory rhetoric, because so far <laughs> you're hearing that I have tried to reach out to all sides, be moderate, cross about one piece, because I couldn't resist, because I got tired of being in a category of people known as bleeding heart liberals. So, because we were compassionate and we wanted to give to people. How do you, so, like, how do you think Jeff Leach called it being, being a bleeding heart conservative? Yeah, well, sorry, you, <laughs> wait a minute, no, I, my word was bleeding ulcer conservative. Yeah. <laughs> because that was only for people who are known by what they're against, not what they're for. Because it takes a lot, of, a lot out of you to always be against. And in fact, studies show that psychologically, people who are always against um, have less energy, don't get as much done, and in some ways people who are for something, that's why I answered your iceberg mm -hmm. question the way I did, people who are for something have a lot more energy to do it. I'll tell you who I have a lot of respect for on the Republican side for many reasons. Some of it is because of the issues that I care about, about the citizens, is John McCain. First of all, because of the character issue. Um, talk about you know having strength of character and sometimes saying unpopular things, non-political, not pandering. I don't agree with him on every social issue. On the other hand, I'm convinced I could change his mind mm -hmm. because I saw him change his mind, not in a Romney-like shape-shifting, but because when AmeriCorps was first proposed by President Clinton in 1993, John McCain was one of the people dead set against it. He said, we don't pay volunteers. And as AmeriCorps took hold and it was clear that national service at the community level was doing really, really good things, City Year and all those other programs were flourishing, he changed his mind. He looked at the evidence and he became the sponsor with Evan Bayh of the reauthorization of AmeriCorps. And so I have a huge amount of respect for that. And so I feel on some of those other issues where I don't agree with him, I'll bet he listens. Mm -hmm. Let, me, let, me, let me add to yeah. this, if I could, just Go slightly, ahead. because there's, the Republican grouping is, is, is a wide grouping. Uh, John McCain should be most respected because he was knocked down more than any other American. Yeah. Yeah. And he got back up. And that is very impressive. Uh, and then if you look at the Republican groups, you've got one who voted against the war uh, named Ron Paul. And uh, not everyone's a libertarian, but there are more than a few libertarian principles in this book. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's about America doing things uh, that are entrepreneurial. 
Uh, and I will, I will give you a Ron Paul quote. Uh, Ron came and sat down to me after we had a vote on authorizing the war in, in, in Iraq. And uh, we knew the two of us were going to vote against it. But I turned to Ron and I said, what was your principal reason? And Ron said, and that really caught me off guard totally. He said, Jim, as a libertarian, I can accept that there can be a valid case for war. But shouldn't it be rare? And I said to him that was one of the most profound comments I had heard. Uh, this notion that, that it should be rare. Wars of choice should be rare. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, commends, uh, 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 frankly, his judgment for, for people that are thinking in a very entrepreneurial way. Mm -hmm. And maybe this would be individual entrepreneurship rather than social entrepreneurship. I'd like to call some, I'd like to call some students down now for questions. Uh, there's a microphone here. There's a microphone over here. Um, and one right up there. Hello, Phil. <laughs> Uh, my name is Philip Martin. I'm a MPP here, first year, and was in Professor K. Mark's class this year. Uh, I actually have a question about uh, the idea of hope. When we saw the Democrat, the recent Democratic presidential debates, the first round of questions for the first 15 minutes from uh, Wolf Blitzer and the CNN panel were all very divisive and trying to get them to split hairs on stuff. This idea that I think the candidates aren't talking about as much hope, is that because the press won't let them or the press won't talk about it? Or are they actually not making a strong enough effort to be positive in their remarks? For the record, I'd like it noted that my students ask awfully good questions. <laughs> Go ahead, resident. Well, I mean, the media, I've been, um, you know, now that I've been on a book tour, I've been on a lot of radio shows, and I was on one right-wing radio show out of Chicago where he kept saying, isn't it terrible the way people are fighting? And so I said, who's the we that's making that happen? I think the media has a lot to do with that. I think there is a lot of substance in the campaign. I mean, I've read the policy positions in great detail of, of um, Hillary Clinton's campaign, for example, there's a lot of substance. There's a lot of gotcha journalism, a lot of trying to pin people down to saying things they'll regret later, which means then you hear a lot of caution, unless you're Dennis Kucinich. Um, and I'm glad he's speaking out, actually, because once in a while it puts things in play. Um, so what makes good press? Again, this is part of the subtitle here, is what do Americans want from our leaders? So, do we want the best gladiator um, who does the best in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the war of words? Is that, what, is that what's going to help people govern? I mean, part of my concern, for example, about John Edwards and maybe Fred Thompson and some others is that people whose backgrounds are largely adversarial, um, but most, so it's mostly Edwards, are not necessarily going to be really good at what you have to do to govern, which is you have to be able to talk across all kinds of divides and bring people together. That's where experience does matter, too, that you have a lot of relationships and you've managed to keep them kind of cordial. That's a good thing. And being in the Senate is good experience for that for both parties. Um, but who gets us fighting? I mean, what is it that we want to watch? How big would the audience be for um, a positive debate. If we can prove that there's a huge audience to hear about, you know, positive proposals, then I'm sure the media would read the numbers. David, do you want to do you want to um, I, 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 talk yeah, to that for a minute? Is, is, as uh, Alex Jones could really speak to this better than I could, but uh, as many problems as I have with the press. Uh, these days, I don't think the press is the primary uh, culprit and why the campaign has not been very substantive. Uh, I, I do think that the candidates have been speaking to a remarkable degree in generalities or vague, vagueness. There is nobody on the Democratic side right now who would emerge from this campaign, in my judgment, based on what they've said so far, with a clear mandate. It would just really be hard to say that people voted for Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton because they were going to do the following three things, and that that candidate could claim that mandate at the end of the campaign, which I think really makes a big difference in governing. And and there, you know, you can't, you know, you can't campaign as Hillary Clinton is 
about, I'm going to change Social Security by appointing a commission and make that a mandate. I mean, it just isn't the kind of thing, it's, it's very thin gruel. And, and the candidates have not stepped up to, in my judgment, uh, really dealing with some very significant hard issues. They have put out health care plans that, that address the issue of access. But when you've got to reform Medicare, in which everybody already has access, the critical question is how do you deal with costs? That's the hard one, and in, in which you get a lot of tension. And, and you, you, how are you really going to deal seriously with climate change? Well, nobody really wants to talk about how we're going to, you know, carbon has a cost, but we have no price for it. What kind of pricing mechanism should we have for carbon? That's going to be a very divisive, hard question. The Democrats don't want to talk about this because it means higher taxes. And nobody wants, and, and if you're a Democrat, the one thing you don't want to get through is done being hung is spend and spend, tax and tax. And it's sort of, it's, there's a neuralgia about that, and I understand it. But as long as you're sort of backing away from being straight about what's coming, I mean, I, I think the Democrats face a dilemma. If you tell people what really is the situation we face, the reality, and what needs to be done, holding out hope to be sure, but, holding, but telling people what needs to be done, it's probably hard, very hard to get elected. But if you don't tell people what needs to be done, you. when you get in office, you're not going to have a mandate, and they're going to think it was bait and switch. You told us about how easy this is going to be, and now you're telling us all these tough things. Let's go to the young man here, and then we'll go over here. Hi, uh, I'm MVP2 here. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, I find it really um, surprising that uh, Romney felt the need to talk about his faith or Mormonism. I don't know if he talked about it that much, but still he gave a speech. And at the same time, you have Huckabee, who is getting away with saying that he doesn't believe in evolution. And I find this really, it's, I personally find it ridiculous that a politician can get away not ever talking why he doesn't believe in evolution in this day and age, while there is another politician who felt, feels the need to uh, uh, justify or talk about his religion. I just absolutely, uh, I'm baffled by this. <laughs> Somebody want to take that on, Jim? Okay. Yeah, if, if, if Mitt Romney were at 3%, he wouldn't have to give a talk about Mormonism. But it's because he's out there as a front runner. The reason run, uh, that Mike Huckabee hasn't had to respond uh, on creationism versus, uh, you know, Darwin, is that he was a, he was a second tier asterisk kind of candidate. So the press just doesn't give heavy scrutiny to people who are in that second tier. There are a lot of other questions you could raise well, about. And let me, and, let me... But, but now it's switching. And now when Huckabee's on the cover of Newsweek, as he is this week, and, he, and he's coming out, believe me, that issue is going to come to the fore. Let, let me just add something here. They are right now talking to a very small slice of the electorate. Yeah. If they were talking to, if New York State or California was the first primary, this would prob conversation would probably not be happening. In fact, they're talking to, there are maybe going to be 90,000 people who go to the Republican caucuses in Iowa. Of those 90,000, probably the biggest group are going to be Christian evangelicals. And Christian evangelicals don't like Mormons because Mormons don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. Now, that's a biggie for that very, very small sliver of the electorate. So something that doesn't make sense from, in a sort of macro sense, it seems sort of ridiculous, if you get inside that world, the world they're playing in now, which is not the whole United States of America, and it's certainly not Massachusetts, okay, if, if you get inside their little world, there is a logic to that, and that's a logic that comes in primaries, uh, particularly. Uh, the Democrats will have their own version of that logic uh, as well. So that the little explanation, yeah. Yeah, well, that kind of also responds to what David said earlier about the Democrats are putting out generalities so they don't have a mandate. I, I want to come back, and maybe we can talk about that a little, because our views might differ slightly. But this is saying that on the Republican side, at least those candidates, how are they going to have a mandate if they get the God mandate? I mean, that's also not, that's focusing on things that aren't exactly telling people in general what they would do if they were president. You're right, it's talking to very, very narrow groups of people. And I think, you know, on the Democratic side, people are afraid um, of the details, same way. Let's go up here. My name is Aaron Michael. I'm a joint degree student here and across the river at the business school. You know, both 
political parties today seem to be getting better and better at battling each other, uh, both the parties and the movements behind them, conservatives and, and liberals. Uh, you know, you, you have the, the Heritage Institute on one side and uh, all of these other institutions, and then on the other side, America coming together and all of the 527s and so on. But Bob Rubin recently came to the business school and he said that while people are getting better and better at getting elected, we're, we, the governing process itself is basically broken. Um, but he also said in response to a question that part of the reason that the governing process is broken is not uh, it is not campaign finance reform, that money in politics isn't a problem. I wanted to find out what you thought about that, and you know, if you think that it is a problem and it should be reformed, how should it be reformed in light of the fact that the Supreme Court thinks that money has a role uh, in politics and that is protected by the court? Jim, do you want to take that, since you're the only one up here who's yeah. raised well, first, money? First, let, let, me, let me go on, on, on one premise and then go to the money issue. Uh, uh, politics is broken. We have more leadership in America than we've ever had in the arts, in business, science, everywhere except public life. Uh, and then you go to the question of why. And part of it is the political process. One has been hinted at earlier that very narrow segments participate in primaries and are nominating candidates. Uh, but another is this money in politics issue. And, and let me explain it very carefully. If uh, any of you in this room are thinking that you might want to run for public office or you've thought about it in the past at some earlier time in your life, I guarantee you, you thought about how do you afford it? And one of the things you think about is, how do you raise money? And how about that other person? Because there's always, a, you have to have a very individual targeted race. And where is that other person getting money? And just to begin with, I have found the most decent Americans don't like to ask people for money, except if it's for a cause. I mean, for example, uh, I had a rule in life, I never asked anybody in my life for any money. I never took PAC money, although I raised money in small contributions. I couldn't look anyone in the eye and say, would you give me money for my campaign? I could look you in the eye and say, I'd like you to give a contribution to the Kennedy School. But it's very different to say, give it to me. Many Americans have this, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a very big psychological thing. And the type of person that that's an easy thing to do is not necessarily the type of person the country wants to elect. Then you look at the money in politics, and there isn't anyone in public life who says a contribution of $5,000 from a PAC, that doesn't have a conflict with me. Well, where, where is common sense? If you receive $5,000 from me as a political action committee, you might say, well, I'll at least listen to you. Well, part of political life is who you listen to. Your hours are limited. If I'm the guy that's gonna get in the door, that's a contract to get into the door. More than that, if I have a special interest and I give you $5,000, A, you must listen to me. B, it's an implicit contract, I'll give you another 5,000 in the next election if you vote the right way. Uh, this is a system in radical need of radical change. Now here the Supreme Court has made some rulings and I, I cannot believe in my view that the Supreme Court is thinking when it says money is free speech. Uh, I used to introduce a, a, a bill every year and would get no co-sponsors and all it said was that the Congress of the United States could put limits on what an individual puts in their own campaign and the states could put limits on what individuals could put in their campaigns for state and, and city office. The reason being, we're very close to a billionocracy. We've got a possibility this year someone's gonna put a billion dollars in a campaign. Some have put tens of millions in campaigns. How can that be democracy? And we're trying to spread democracy in the world. We're in the need of radical campaign reform. And it can only come from either total public financing or partial public financing. Uh, it, it's the only way that you can get conflicts out of the system 
so that representatives represent people, but it's also the only way you can get competition into the system where anyone feels free to run. And we should not have a system where the majority of Americans do not feel that they have access to the capacity to seek public office. David, did you want to add to that? Yes, I, <clears throat> I think Jim Leach has much wisdom to offer about campaign finance reform. I think the issues of leadership transcend the campaign finance reform, uh, and I actually think they transcend politics. Uh, we've been conducting national surveys on leadership, America's perceptions of our leadership now for three years at our Center for Public Leadership in conjunction with the U.S. News. And we, we have a project to identify America's best leaders, and we have about 15 to 20 a year. We've been finding there's some very good individuals out there, but the, the, there is a widespread perception in the public that with the exception of the medical field, and the military, that we are not well led in most other fields, including business. And the, three years ago, 65% said that we were uh, in a crisis in leadership national, across the board. Last year, it was up to 69%. This year, it's up to 76%. Uh, three quarters believe that unless we fix it soon, we're going to be a nation in decline. I believe that we have some very serious leadership deficiencies that extend well beyond politics. Fixing parts of the system will help, such as campaign finance reform. But what we've also learned is that it makes a difference to have someone in the presidency who does try to transcend party lines and bring us together. At various times when we've been deeply polarized, and we have been polarized in the past, uh, Jefferson has come along who was, spoke right from his, you know, we're all Federalists, uh, we're, we're all Republicans here. Uh, Lincoln, over very, through very difficult times, you know, did a point and, and worked to bring us together. I mean, read, read a team of rivals. Or look at it when, when people thought this country was coming apart and had really were giving up hope on democracy in the late 20s, early 30s. And then along came Franklin Roosevelt. And it transformed people's sense of possibilities. And I have to tell you, in the late 70s, there was a widespread view in Washington that government was broken, that politics was broken. I remember Lloyd Cutler, a man Elaine and I worked with and both esteem, uh, was arguing we needed a constitutional convention. We needed a sort of parliamentary type system, mm -hmm. uh, that we'd had a series of presidents who couldn't govern. Uh, and then along came the most improbable of figures uh, in Ronald Reagan. And whether you agree or disagree with him as, about his policies, he was a leader. And it made a difference. And within a few months after people got in there, people, you know, after he got in the office, people said, you know, it's possible to govern this country with a good leader. So there is a real question. To me, the real issue in, the, in this election is not who's going get, to get, be elected. But is, the question is, can the winner lead? Mm -hmm. Can the winner right. govern? Let's go. Let's get two more student questions in here and here, and then we'll have to call it a day. So I'm sorry to anybody else. I'll defer to the gentleman from Virginia. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> you've never done that before. <laughs> the gentleman from Colorado is very generous. Uh, <laughs> my, uh, my name is Graves Tompkins. Uh, I, uh, like my friend here, joint degree students at the business school. Um, my question actually uh, um, stems just from your, from your last comment in terms of uh, the ability to lead. Uh, it seems to me, you know, the historical, I, I haven't, haven't been around for that long, uh, certainly, but the historical significance of this election uh, really strikes me, um, given the seriousness of the challenges we face, as you talked about before, but then also how dynamic uh, this race is and how early it has begun. Uh, in many ways, it feels like we should be voting for our president today, um, even though we haven't even had our first pr primary. Um, I wonder, you know, a, a month from now, this race will certainly look differently uh, than it does today, and, and by the you know, by February 5th, it will certainly look different. Um, and then between February and, and November, there seems to be a, a pretty um, significant vacuum. Um, <laughs> and given what we've seen in previous elections, um, I wonder, you know, what takes place in that vacuum, whether it's a third party candidate, uh, whether it's, you know, a lot of, of, um, of negative attacks, uh, or whether perhaps, you know, things have changed, as, as you mentioned, the public's desire for optimism. Um, but I guess the question I'm left with is, you, you know, what, how, does this, how is this race going to shake out? Um, what, are, what are we going to be left with? 
Um, if you want to predict who's going to win the presidency, I'm sure everyone here would love to hear that. <laughs> but, but, but more importantly, how do we, how can we hope for, you know, by, by November, how can we hope to, to really remain intact and not be tired of this thing? Uh, because it seems to me that it, it really is just beginning. Rosabeth, you're our guest of honor. Why don't you take this last one? Um, thank you. Well, I mean, that was a profound statement of what the dilemma is. The, the solutions I see for what can take place, again, they come from my vantage point from some things I know are already going on. And that is, I, I really think um, it's up to us. That is, it's up to people who are passionate about, about a cause, about an issue, about something they want to see the next president do, regardless of party, to organize and put that forward during this time. So, for example, I talk about national service is one of my big causes. David Gergen shares that with me. There is now a group of people, a bipartisan group, organizing a summit on service to be held sometime in the spring when it's pretty clear who the candidate is from each party to rally all those groups who care about this to start crafting a sufficient plan so that when the next president takes office, that next president can hit the ground running with something. So David had said earlier, one of the problems is the candidates on the Demo Democratic side are mired in generalities. Well, we could argue about that because I think um, if you have too many details, you know, what are you vo actually voting for the details? You're voting for the direction. But we could actually fill that time with issue-oriented proposals for how would citizen diplomacy work if we really want more foreign aid of a kind on the ground that's going to improve American relationships in the world through grassroots diplomacy in African villages to Latin American barrios. That can happen in that vacuum instead of swift boating, instead of looking for the, the dirt on the candidates. And so the Summit on National Service is going to be one of those. Why aren't other people, you guys, you'll have a whole summer, convene a <laughs> summit on the next economy and put it before the representatives of all of the candidates. I mean, in some ways, we citizens, if we're not going to, can't afford to run for office, we have to seize the apparatus of issue definition ourselves. I think that that could make a big difference. And, and then whoever is elected, so first of all, it would kind of shape what the candidates say, and you'd see those organized constituencies could tell which one they prefer. But we have to be ready to go with a health care plan, regardless of who's president, because we can't stick with what we've got now. Too many people are suffering. And we need to go with education reform that's real at the national level. So. That'll be a great opportunity to do it. We could call it a summer of issues. And, and, <laughs> okay. And who's going to emerge as a winner? Who's going to emerge <laughs> as a winner from that? Well, I actually think it's the Democrats to lose. Um, just because people have, you know, rem remember who got us into the mess. And it's hard for people to run against their own president. Okay, okay David? What about you? Yeah. What about you? you have views on that? My view is that, is that we will have a very, very long general election campaign. And I would like to think that Rosabeth is right and that it's possible to turn it into a constructive dialogue in America. I doubt it, okay? I think it will be lots and lots of dissection of each major party candidate against each other. Um, I think we are in an era of extreme polarization. I don't see it ending, even though I wish it would. Um, and I think that a lot of people in the primaries are looking at their respective candidates and saying, who can take the punch and who can deliver the punch? <clears throat> they want to know who's tough out there. And the fact is there are real differences. Not everybody agrees that we need to do something about health care. That's just not, that's not the case. Not everybody agrees we must do something about education. There are people in the Republican Party who will argue quite, I don't agree with them, but they will argue quite genuinely that doing something about those things on the part of the government is actually worse than the status quo. 
That, now that is a really interesting and good argument to have. I would like that argument to go on over the summer, and maybe there's some ways, and maybe Roosevelt could help the Kennedy School think of some ways to make that argument substantive. But it will be a fight, and I think it's going to be a really intense fight because I think there's an awful lot at stake. And this administration has left a legacy of polarization. And so the Democratic Party is ready to fight back just as brutally as they were fought against in 2004. And so I don't think, and so nobody's going to uh, be nice guys this time around. I, real quickly, Elaine, I certainly bow to your, your political savvy and often turn to you to find out about real politics. So clearly what I'm talking about is possibility. And I guess because I know the Alan Caseys of the world who actually think we could change it, I'm thinking it does not have to be the way it's been just because it's been that way. I know change is tough. Mm -hmm. But if there are people who, that's where leaders emerge. So I guess all I'm saying is what's our choice? Do we let it stay the way it is and enjoy the hand wringing and the complaining? or? Do some of us say, let's get involved and do it? My particular way is I had maybe a little voice so I could put out, put out some ideas and hope lots of other people talk about them. But there may be other ideas in this room. Right. Do we have time With for that, ideas? With that, David, you get the, the last no, no, word because well, I'm going to turn no, it let's, over let's to Jim in a minute. Yeah. I, uh, look, I, I think there's no question that the landscape favors the Democrats in 2008. Uh, and that's why the least reported story about this whole election is the very strong likelihood that the Democrats are going to gain seats in both the House and the Senate. That reflects the landscape. That, and, and the sort of, uh, I, I think American politics tends to move in cycles, as you know, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. wrote about and his dad wrote about. And I think that the, the, the sort of the Reagan cycle is sort of winding down, and it has opened the way for a new democratic cycle. If they, if they, you know, if they can live up to that, that moment. Um, but given the way that is, what's what the Republicans? Here's the here's the dilemma we face. The Republicans are going to look at this and say, generically, if people are asked, you want the Democrats or Republicans to win the presidency, the Democrats have a 15 point lead. So what do you do? You have to tear down the individual who gets the Democratic nomination. You demonize that individual and help to, open, to, to even the score. Uh, and if you're a Democrat, you can't give that the other side that free shot. You've got to retaliate by demonizing their guy to make him look even worse. Uh, and that's the cycle that I'm afraid we're in. And the Republicans have this added incentive. If you talk to some Republicans seriously, they're going to tell you, we can't win 2008. We're probably not going to win this. But our comeback's going to be in 2010. And that's when we're going to take back the House and we're going to take back the Senate. Because why? Because the country will be so sick of a, a government that's not working, they will give the reins back to us. Sure. How do they get from here to there? They make sure the government doesn't work. Yeah. They, and, they, and they make it clear we're not participating in this. And you know, look how awful Hillary is in the office or something. We need the Republicans back in. That is the cycle that we're all in. And we're caught in it. And getting out of that is really hard. I do think, that, to agree, I agree with Roosevelt, there is this very fertile, unusual period. And great of you to put your finger on it. We have the earliest time for selection, and we have the latest conventions. So we have a really long time period. And that is time for, if we could, to have a, 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 a constructive conversations. And maybe, Jim, there's a way the forum could be the site of some of those on the key issues over time. That would be a really, if we get the campaigns in here, the representatives to talk about the key issues, that would be a really a constructive thing to do, to figure out how do we, how do we look at this. I do think there are some things that are floating out there. I, you know, I, I, I just want to briefly, I'll close on this. I want to call attention to a speech that Barack Obama gave last week on, on I don't know, have you read the speech that he gave on national service? And, uh, but it was very much about social entrepreneurs. Uh, he wants to create a social enterprise agency. He wants to expand AmeriCorps, basically double the size of AmeriCorps. Uh, it was a lot of the kind of things you and I, Rosabeth, have talked about in the past, uh, that, uh, that uh, the, 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 the social entrepreneurship movement is sponsoring. So, and those are the kind of things we ought to explore, because those are, I still think we need to talk about government reform. I'm sorry we didn't get there tonight. 
but I think there, there are six areas that Rosabeth outlined in her excellent book, and I, I want to support the book finally, because I did write an endorsement for the book. Uh, and uh, it, it's well worth reading, because I think it does offer some very creative ideas in the midst of this sort of miasma uh, that we're all experiencing. Uh, can we think in creative ways about, ah, yeah, we could do that. And that's a, I, I, that, that would be really a strikingly interesting idea. The book is very valuable for that purpose. We're going to uh, cut off, sorry to the gentleman from Colorado, we're going to cut off discussion just a couple minutes early tonight because um, I want to make two announcements. First of all, Rosabeth will be signing books at the Coop right after uh, this session tonight. Um, and secondly, this is the last forum for Bill White. And he has been here for many years. He's going off first to Iowa, then to be an, a, a secretary in the Deval Patrick administration. So it's just, we're, we're heartbroken that we're going to lose him. And I think there's a lot of people who want to say things about Bill. Um, Jim, the floor is yours. I think you're the master of ceremonies here. Uh, Thank where is Bill? We what? want to where bring Bill first? forward here. <laughs> where is come he? Come on, Bill. Hey, come, Down here. Uh, this is Bill. Uh, Let me say, uh, for those of you who don't know, Bill has been running the forum for eight years. Uh, he's joined by his uh, uh, daughter, Madeline, and with us also is his son, Brendan, and wife, uh, Jen, somewhere. Uh, and uh, we have some well-wishers, Bill. Uh, the, uh, just as Bill has uh, left uh, the school for public service, we have a someone on the phone who also has just left for public service. And I don't know how this exactly works. If someone can help me on this. Christian? Do we have the voice? Okay, all right. Well, I apologize. Let me, let me uh, add to this that uh, um, Bill's family uh, came from the automobile business, as I understand, the Chevy business. And we have uh, someone at the Kennedy School who has the, the greatest quote in the history of the car business. And this is uh, uh, Larry Summers, who once commented, Bill, that uh, uh, no one in the history of the world ever, uh, ever washed a used car. And the analogy I make here is that your father was, ran a Chevy dealership, and you're known to have once owned, owned a 20-year-old uh, Chevy that was considered quite large and was quite well washed. And uh, I th I, when I think, thought about that, I thought Bill has been very active in, in public affairs and in campaigns, and that uh, government has to be washed periodically. And that the way one owns government is to participate in government, uh, and particularly with sweat uh, rather than with money, and that that has kind of been your life. And, uh, the washing of the car of government is a, a great analogy. Uh, do we have the voice, Christian? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Well, then let me let me also tell uh, many 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 <laughs> many people know Bill by his language, and I. Okay. Uh, let me introduce to, to everybody uh, uh, the former director of the Institute of Politics, uh, Governor Jean Shaheen. Jean, do you have any words of wisdom? Oh, no words of wisdom, only words of congratulations. And I wanted to tell Bill how excited I am for him and how sorry I am for the forum because he's been such a wonderful director for so many years. And uh, just wish, wish him luck and everybody at the Institute of Politics luck. Thank you, Jean. Well, thank you very much, Jean. Uh, Anyway, I, I want to tell one more anecdote before introducing the, the, someone else. But uh, uh, Bill has a way of talking that I thought uh, was uh, interesting grammar, and then I thought it was cultural. And then I un came to the conclusion that it's all about team. Bill likes to say, 
me and you, we've got to go now. <laughs> he never uses the I word. Never in his life have I heard him use the I word. This, this is the ultimate team guy. And uh, uh, everybody here at the school has always felt that. Uh, in any regard, uh, if I could, uh, let me uh, uh, introduce and, and uh, is, is the phone ready again? Would David Gergen, would you care to say anything about our friend Bill? I'll, I'll just uh, speak from my chair and, and thank you, Madeline, for coming here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a night we hope that you'll treasure because you really should hear about your dad. You probably don't see him some evenings. He, he spends a lot of time here at night, and you're probably asleep by the time he gets home. Uh, at least we hope you are. The, uh, uh, but uh, he has been a real treasure to have here at the, our school, and we thank you for sharing him. Uh, and, but but uh, uh, he went here, uh, Bill you know, went here and got a degree, and then stayed on and uh, ran this forum. He's done it wonderfully well. Uh, he has uh, run it with great imagination. Uh, his, he even lets Republicans come speak here occasionally, <laughs> even though he doesn't like what they have to say. Um, and, uh, but... Uh, Bill, I think all of us here have uh, really enjoyed working with you. I think we all feel that this, this is the right time for you to go make this move. And to go to work for the Patrick administration, I think, would be an a enormous next step for you. And we just thank you for what the service you've given to the school and to this, this community. And we look forward to the day when you come back here to speak at the forum. But thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, joining us now, if he would, is the former dean of the Kennedy School of Government uh, and also the father of the notion of soft power, uh, a precept, by the way, that Bill fully agrees with in all regards except four or five, and that is uh, uh, soft power should not apply to the uh, uh, a baseball team here in Boston, a football team here in Boston, a, a basketball and, and uh, a hockey team, but also uh, uh, to the Milton Youth League, where I understand Bill is a legendary coach. But let me introduce Dr. Joe Nye. Thank you, Jim. Just to uh, give you some idea of what Bill has contributed, let me imagine the task of recruiting his successor. Somebody comes in and they say, now what's this job like? And you say, well, long hours, little credit. In fact, if you succeed, you get no credit at all. But if anything goes wrong, everybody is going to criticize, and you're going to be the center of the criticism. And so the candidate that you're trying to recruit says, hmm, that doesn't sound all that exciting. And the next thing the candidate says is, well, who runs this forum anyway? Oh, you're in charge of the forum. But the dean thinks he runs it. The director of the Institute of Politics thinks he runs it. Uh, the faculty think they run it. The students think they run it. And they're all right. <laughs> and you realize that it's a thankless task. And then you say, well, but what about the people who come? They say, well, they're really very interesting people. And they're all prima donnas. And each one of them wants absolutely special attention and you're not only going to have to get special attention to them, but extra tickets for their friends or this organization or that organization. And you say, well, wait a minute, how did you do this? And Bill would be too modest to say that. The answer is with grace and a surety of touch. The forum has run in the last decade in a manner which has paid enormous tribute to the school. Everybody has gotten great credit. The school gets the kudos, the press plays up the school and so forth. You never see the name Bill White in the headlines, but anybody who's watched it knows that it's because of Bill White that it's all worked. So I just want to say on the behalf of one uh, ex-dean that uh, Bill, the school is enormously grateful to you for a superb job that you've done. And uh, if you'll just do as good a job for the government of Massachusetts, we'll all benefit again. So thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd li now like to call to the 
call to the podium one of the world's great advocates of human rights, uh, uh, Samantha Power. So many of you know Bill as the uh, affable, rigorous, politically savvy face of the forum. I know him as a fanatic, a, a Red Sox fanatic, where all the virtues that we prize here at the Kennedy School go out the window, where you privilege winning over fairness, passion over reason, and prejudice over tolerance. As a general rule, that's what being a Red Sox fan, uh, especially if you have a particular relationship to the Yankees, uh, entails. I didn't know Bill very well in 2004. 2004 is the year that uh, the Red Sox made their historic run. And, uh, but I found myself with an extra ticket to a first round playoff game and it would prove to be the beginning of what would be this historic, unprecedented or precedented once 86 years before uh, trip to the, the World Series and then ultimate victory in the World Series. And I had this extra ticket and I offered it to Bill because he was renowned around the school for again, things other than his political savvy, rigor and affability. And um, we shared a somewhat biblical experience together, which is that we shared a walk-off home run. And by David Ortiz in the 10th inning. By David Ortiz in the 10th inning. And, and if any of you have been at sporting events, and I, we have international uh, audiences here, so people may not know much about baseball, but you know from football games and so forth, that you, if you can imagine how you interact with perfect strangers when historic and heroic things happen, imagine acquaintances. Uh, it's a very, very uh, quick way of getting to know somebody in a hurry and everybody in our entire section bounding up and down. But within a week, our spirits had tumbled and we had fallen behind the uh, loathsome New York Yankees. And uh, we were, each of us, though we didn't communicate, made separate treks to what we call the House of Doom, which is Yankee Stadium in New York. I went my way, he went his way, we didn't communicate. And we both, I wore my Real Women Don't Date Yankee Fans t-shirt. And um, Bill was uh, better dressed. Um, I, I would subsequently learn because we walk in and we each were getting heckled. And, and uh, I actually went with my mother and somebody spit on my mother in the House of Doom, which was absolutely, I know. See, now we're turning everybody in the direction they should be. That never happens at Fenway Park. Anyway, in the House of Doom, in this with this heckling, uh, sort of fiercely uh, exhilarated audience, because they had gone ahead in the series, I believe then it was two games to nothing, um, a very hard uh, deficit to come back from, suddenly through the thicket of these large Yankee fans, I see the innocent, affable, rigorous face of Bill White uh, at Yankee Stadium. And there, again, the bond solidified for life. I think both of us, as Democrats and people who self-identify as liberals every now and then, uh, it was the, the, the closest I think either of us had ever really felt uh, to being minorities in this country. Um, <laughs> uh, the experience of persecution, we live very, very privileged lives and we were very aware of that, but I think our, our credentials as, as Democrats committed to the underdog uh, very much locked in. And of course the Red Sox would go on to go down three nothing and come back and win against the Yankees historically. Now the, with this friendship forged in destiny, the story should end there. Um, and, and Bill, a, a lifelong supporter of the underdog, it just should be obvious in the presidential race who he'd be working for. But instead, he has chosen in this historic time at a crossroads in our nation's history to side with the New York Yankees of Democratic presidential candidates, <laughs> Hillary Clinton. And I don't know, I don't know, but I know that she's incredibly fortunate to have him um, I know that um, we're incredibly unfortunate to lose him. He will be back hosting his own forum, telling us how to help the underdog in the state of Massachusetts and in the country as a whole. And then last word, see you in Iowa. Thank you, Samantha. We, we now have a caller who is a former governor, a former senator, a former director of the Institute of Politics, uh, David Pryor. David, are you with us? <laughs> we, David? Yes. Uh, we are yes. honored that you've called in. Do Thank you have any, anything to comment? Am I? Am I? 
on the air now? You, you've got thousands listening to you, David. Wonderful. Well, I, I've always had the great fear of following Samantha Power, but I will be glad to follow her in this, in this situation. Well, I, I was just sitting here with Barbara, my wife, and both of us uh, just say, or thinking wonderful things, I guess you would say, about Bill White and Jen and their contribution to the Institute of Politics these years. But more than anything else, I guess I'm thinking about the countless young men and women all over this country and all over this world who have been touched by and influenced by this extremely unique man, Bill White who is not only my friend, but certainly your friend, and who, in my opinion, epitomizes what the Institute of Politics is all about. And he epitomizes what I think the Kennedy family is all about in giving back in the field of public service. The Forum for Bill White has been not only a home, it has been for him an opportunity to spread the idea and the concept of democracy and what we are about in this country. I remember on so many forums when I was there as director of the Institute, Jim, I remember that Bill would come over after the forum was over and whoever it was who had spoken, man or woman, whoever it might be, he always many times used the word. He was so excited. He said, wasn't that a soaring speech? Wasn't that soaring? Well, I think that 30 or 40 years from now, when people mention the name Bill White and relate it to the forum and to the Institute of Politics and to the Kennedy School of Government, I think they're going to constantly remember and say that the name of Bill White still soars uh, here within these walls. For him, every forum has been thrilling. Every speaker has been unique. He has never lost his enthusiasm. And just to get to know him those few years that I was there was a wonderful opportunity. And, and from Barbara Pryor and myself, we simply say, Thank you, Bill, for this opportunity and this very high honor and privilege of knowing you and in our mind and in our hearts, the name of Bill White will always soar. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, David, for uh, your thoughtful words and for your state for producing so many fine senators. Well, thank you. Uh, Is Jim? Yes. Jim, I think you probably have the best job in the world. Well, I, I don't deny and I that. I congratulate you for it. Well, thank you very much. And you're losing a wonderful, wonderful man, Bill White. And uh, he, he has really made a difference. He's never lost his enthusiasm. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Jim. And all of you, thank you so much. Uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to introduce the, the Shorenstein Center director, Alex Jones. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about Bill from the perspective of someone who has effectively felt anyway that uh, he was in partnership with Bill at some of the most important moments in the life of the Shorenstein Center. The Shorenstein Center is the Shorenstein Center on the press, politics, and public policy. It's a, a, one of the research centers here at the Kennedy School that's focused on the press. And several times a year, we have events in the forum uh, under the auspices of the IOP uh, that are critically important to us. They're really the high points of each year. And I have felt for the whole time I have been here that I have been in partnership with Bill in making those memorable and, and excellent. And for that reason, you may 
perhaps understand why tonight I'm going to reveal something to Bill that I have done my best to keep a secret all these years. Since I was eight years old, I've been a Yankee fan. <laughs> and when you grow up in Tennessee in the 1950s and you're a Yankee fan, it takes even more courage than to stand up in Cambridge, Massachusetts and declare yourself one. The partnership is absolutely serious. Uh, Bill was essential to the critically important moments that we had. And I want to just give you a sense of, of what some of those were. I mean, some of those moments that you've been hearing about from others have been ones of, of, of great triumphs, such as I remember when David McCullough was here. David was a great speaker. He's a superb orator, really. And I remember Bill was so touched by what he said, and you mentioned it to me. There were others, however, that were also memorable, but for somewhat different reasons. I remember when we had Ted Turner here. We had a dinner before, and I was sitting at the table with Ted and Joe and Molly Nye, and Ted was drinking wine before dinner, and he continued to drink wine during dinner. And I remember vividly how he regaled us all with the fact that his recently divorced wife, Jane Fonda, was extraordinarily talented as a sex partner. <laughs> he, he said it in, in terms that made Molly Nye's face absolutely, it looked like she was being blown backwards. <laughs> and so when he finally made it here to this lectern, here in the forum, he was in great form, wouldn't you say that night? <laughs> He, he began by talking about how he'd been turned down by Harvard and how Jane had recently given Harvard a big gift. And as he said, that's my money. <laughs> it was quite a night. We've had many quite a nights with people ranging from Bill O'Reilly to Cy Hirsch, most recently Maureen Dowd. And always, Bill was unflappable and courtly and and he would create, as hyper-organized, create a, a schedule that always made me think of, of something along the lines of you walk in at 6.01 in 30 seconds. It was time to the second almost. And during the course of the evening, as I would be sitting up here or standing up here in the, with the guest, you would always see Bill lurking around the edges, pacing back and forth, making sure everything was going right and doing something else, you could see it on his face, worrying, worrying about rude questions, worrying about disasters of every sort that uh, almost never happen. But Bill's job was making the choreography work and making, make the, making the event one that was focused, as Joe and I said, up here on what was happening and the invisible hand of Bill and his colleagues in making it all happening. They were the producers and directors of a real show and they've been doing it with extraordinary success for all this time. This, uh, about a year ago, Bill got the greatest test, at least in my, in my experience, when we had E.J. Dion here to speak. And he was speaking in the dead of winter and was coming from Washington and his plane was late. The person who was probably the most gallant person I think I've ever seen speak here that was here that night, her name was Molly Ivan. Some of you may know her, a columnist who died, unfortunately, just a couple of months after that. It was clear that night that she had cancer and she was not going to be around much longer. We had to improvise because we were waiting on, on EJ to arrive and Bill sent, you know, cars and we were waiting for him to come and, and Molly stepped into the breach with a sort of extemporaneous conversation with me that went on for, you know, quite a long time. It was one of those moments when the producer and director had to be at his very best. As I said, Bill always seemed to be there, calm, unflappable, intelligent, and he made it work. 
Bill, I am sorry you're leaving, sincerely. But I want to thank you on behalf of the Shorenstein Center for the crucial role you, pay, you played so many times in making what happened here so memorable and so valuable to us. You made us and you made me look good, and I want to thank you most sincerely and offer you the very best wishes in the future. Well, please uh, welcome one of our panelists and one of the profoundest political experts here at the Kennedy School, Elaine Kmark. Um, first of all, I think Bill's wife and his little boy ought to come up here, too. We ought to get to see them. Can they come on up? Je Jen and Brendan, you come on up and sit up here, too, because we want to see you guys as well. This is... I, when, when you have a father, <laughs> when you have a dad who spends as many nights away from home as I'm sure Bill did, you need to share, right, in, in, the, uh, in the glory. I knew Bill before the Kennedy School, and I suspect I'll know him after the Kennedy School. I know Bill in a different context, as one of the most talented political operatives in this country. Uh, four years ago, at exactly this time, there was a Democratic senator from Massachusetts who everybody thought was completely and totally dead in the water. And some of us, however, heard that Hooley and the Boston boys were going to Iowa. And those of us who knew what that meant knew, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe John Kerry isn't as dead in the water as he looked. And sure enough, Bill was one of those who went to Iowa. There are famous stories about his potluck dinner strategy in the Iowa caucuses, which I'm not going to go into since we share the same candidate. I want him to use it again and win. Um, but Bill, Bill knows the ins and outs of one of the most important electoral worlds in this country, the Iowa caucuses. He is a great old-fashioned organizer. He is part of a team of Massachusetts Pauls who are known and worshipped throughout the Democratic Party. They are they're in sought after when the general election comes. They're sought after in the Iowa primaries. They are sought after in the New Hampshire primaries. And Bill is among the best. So I, it, I, we've heard about all the wonderful work that he has done here at the Kennedy School. Let me tell you that people who run for president of the United States know who he is and want his services because he's that good. Thanks, Bill, and we'll miss you, but you'll be back. Well, aside from working with one of the great senators from the South, Bill has also worked with one of the great senators of the West. And uh, I have long learned in politics that height is generally an inverse proportioned intellect, but uh, in this case, height is directly proportional to wit. Uh, Senator Benson, no, no, no. are you with us? Are you there? We are well. Alan, you're you're very welcome. Yes. Who, who is this? Who is this speaking? Uh, th this is Jim Leach, Al, and uh, Bill White is sitting to my left. Oh, Jim. Well, I'm glad that you're there. You and Deep, that's a good thing. You deserve that treatment. They'll be good to you. Now, is White sitting there at your right or left? Uh, she's to my left as well. I see. Well, that's, that's what it was when I was there. But uh, nevertheless, the, even though he was of the other faith, mm -hmm. uh, this is a wonderful guy. Wonderful guy. And it was a great pleasure to have him with me when he was there doing what you're doing. So there we are gathered together to honor him. That seems appropriate. I can tell you, he was a tremendous asset uh, and, and a lot of fun and, and uh, saved a lot, a lot of pain. Right? And I found him, him to be loyal and talented and sincere and fair and, and strong and tough, but uh, had a very pocket sense of humor. But I remember some very fascinating forms where we have a lot of spirited interest. He'd say, 
Okay, now here's one for you, Al. Yeah, that sounds like probably we're in the building. Well, thank you, Ellen. Uh, let me just say that the, the mission of the IOP is to inspire young people. Uh, and so we've asked several uh, Harvard students to come forward. The first is uh, Ra Raul uh, Prabhakar, who is a junior in the government uh, department. We call it here a government concentrator. He lives in Lowell House. He's from Baldwin, New York, and he's chair of the IOP Forum Committee. Uh, so Raul. Ah, here we are. In the past eight years, Bill White has given thousands of Harvard undergraduates unparalleled opportunities to listen to, learn from, and challenge world leaders. I know Bill always loves hearing questions from undergraduates in the forum because it's the undergraduates who get up to the microphone, stare down the speaker, no matter who it is and ask the questions that are on everyone else's minds, but what everyone else is too afraid to ask. His respect for undergrads, his candor when we grill him with suggestions for speakers, and sometimes they're pretty outrageous, and his easygoing sense of humor will all be missed. His entire life has been devoted to public service, whether in the State Department, the White House, or here at the Institute of Politics, where the mission is to inspire students to enter public service. Bill is returning to government, and that is nothing short of inspiring. But we have a gift for him, a framed poster that is a small reflection of the impact he's had on Harvard students. We hope you'll hang it in your new office, Bill, and thank you. Now if I could ask uh, Anna Mendy to come up. Anna is a junior history concentrator in Elliott House, uh, and she's chair emeritus of the IOP Forum Committee as well as president-elect of the Institute. Uh, Anna Mendy. Um, I remember the first time I met Bill White. I was sitting right over there in the cafeteria, and Bill sort of rolled up a forum brochure um, and poked me and asked me to come to a forum committee meeting. And ever since then, uh, the forum in particular, and the IOP in general, have really become very central to my experience here at Harvard. And this is not only um, individual to my case, it's also the case for many, many students at the IOP who became involved in the IOP through Bill's uh, motivation and encouragement. Bill, I know we always thank you uh, for all the opportunities you provide to us students here at the IOP, for meeting speakers at receptions, uh, dinners, and all kinds of opportunities that we really um, are thankful for. But moreover, um, something that has meant a lot to me personally has been Bill's um, constant interest in us as individuals, um, either through post-forum discussions where we sit around and have pizza, or where we organize dinners with a forum committee at uh, places such as Fire and Ice. Bill has really encouraged us to get to know one another as individuals. Um, and I know that I've made a lot of long-lasting friendships here at the IOP through Bill. Um, and this is also the case for many, many students at the IOP, and this has meant a lot to us. Uh, everyone knows Bill here as being a very inspirational uh, person, someone we really look up to, someone who has this bubbling energy about him, a uh, contagious passion about the forum. He constantly gives us these rallying speeches before forum events to all of us who usher and help out at the event. Um, and we'll really remember this. It meant a lot to us. Uh, you have been, again, central to my experience here at Harvard, Bill, and to so many students at the IOP. We wish you all the best and hope to see you around frequently at the IOP. Thank you. Well, we won't go that long, but uh, Bill has many friends here, and one of his closest friends is our next speaker, and she helped him uh, uh, see where the first great debates uh, thousands of years ago occurred, and that was in Greece. Join me in welcoming Elaine Papoulias. I want to give you all um, 
a little different view of Bill, Bill's early days at the Kennedy School. We actually started at the exact same time, our, our Kennedy School careers, in the fall of 1999. Bill, I don't know if you remember those days, but you had a lot more hair, and I had a lot less gray hair. <laughs> Over the years, Bill has really become one of my dearest friends here at the Kennedy School and a, a dear friend of the Cochlis program. But it was not like that at the beginning. I remember our, our very first encounter in the fall of 1999 when the, another dear friend, the director of the Cochlis program at that time, Dimitris Kiridis and I, lobbied Bill for an appointment to go and talk to him about an idea that we had for the forum. We called, we emailed, we stopped by her office, he wouldn't respond. He totally ignored us. He totally dissed us. <laughs> he became in our minds like a Wizard of Oz, this unfeeling, mysterious guy that was maybe even a figment of everyone's imagination at the forum. Finally, after some strong arm tactics and divine intervention of the Nick Metropolis sort, we landed an appointment. We eagerly went to that meeting with this great idea and this great news that we wanted to share so desperately with Bill. We had secured the participation of the leaders of the opposition to the Milosevic regime. This was 1999 when Milosevic really was at the height of his power and the opposition was really struggling. Yugoslavia was isolated and their appearance at the Kennedy School would mean their first appearance outside of Serbia and their first sort of public assault on Milosevic. So we thought, we have this in the bag. He's going to welcome it with open arms. We had another thing coming. We sat in his office, and the first thing he said to us is, you're the Kokolis program that I've heard so much about? Aren't you a little young for this? <laughs> what followed was a really heated exchange, complete with a few famous Bill White cuss words. And we'll, in which Bill challenged us to really convince him why Yugoslavia was important, why he should give the forum floor to these opposition leaders, and most importantly, if anyone would show up to hear them. We were flabbergasted. As the meeting ended, Dimitri and I left Bill's office. We were totally jarred. We thought, people at Harvard are really supposed to be nicer than this. <laughs> or at least more PC. A couple of weeks went by and Bill somehow set aside his worries and granted us the opportunity to host this forum. So the event happened and it really was an amazing success. And it was really one of the most poignant um, memories that I have of the forum. But in the immediate aftermath, we were just happiest that we had proved Bill wrong and that these little new kids on the block had actually taught something to Bill White. But seriously, I think in the days that followed that event, it became clear to us that Bill's tough talk had really been sort of instinctual tough love. He had been so disagreeable because he wanted to test our resolve, to test our belief in what we were doing and how much we cared about this place. All of the very things that were so central to him since he resumed his duties on day one as director of the forum. And after that day, Bill never doubted us again and we never doubted us, we never doubted him as, uh, as well. And most importantly to me, I became an FOB, a friend of Bill. Bill, and a fan of Bill, I should say. Uh, you've really been a bedrock of support for the Cochlis program. You made the forum stage welcome, a welcoming place for all of our outlaw leaders from the Balkans. You helped us to grow and expand the program. You had faith in us. You trusted our instincts and ideas, even when those ideas were sort of wacky. And thank God. We came close, but we didn't get ourselves fired for some of those ideas. So I'm really grateful for all you've done for us, for the program, and for letting us be an FOB, but most importantly, that you also became an FOB, a friend of the Balkans. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Thanks for the memories. We have two more speakers, and our next speaker is the Senior Associate Dean and Director of the Degree Programs, uh, Dean Joe McCarthy. Thank you, Jim. We'll take up that uh, remark about the inverse relationship between height and IQ later on. This is, uh, uh, but uh, I will be, if this were a regular forum event, Bill White would be standing back there right now going like this to me. 
So I've been told to be brief, and I will be. I prepared lots of remarks, but I'm going to abridge them uh, in, in respect uh, to the hour and other people who would like to speak. I just want to say, Bill, thanks very much. Thanks for the memories. Thanks for the years. Thanks for being so damn good to our students at all times, the thousands of Kennedy School students as well as Harvard College students who have gone through uh, this place and gone through the university in your years running the forum. You were always, regardless of what Elaine uh, Papulia says, you were always respectful and generous, at least to the students. Uh, and for that, uh, I am really grateful. I'm not surprised, though, because you and I share something in common, and that's our Boston College education. And the Jesuits always told us that the most important thing was to be people for others. That's what they tried to train us to do, something very consistent with the, Boston, uh, with the uh, Kennedy School mission. And so this place has felt like home to both of us over the years. And uh, I am very grateful for that. And so no forum event would be complete without at least an allusion to the 35th president in one of his remarks. And you will recall uh, this allusion that it refers to remarks he made at Yale when he received an honorary degree. Bill, you have the best of both worlds. You have a Boston College education and a Harvard degree. And we look forward to uh, all the wonderful things you're going to do with that Harvard degree to make us proud in the future. Thanks, my friend. And here's something to symbolize your ties to the Kennedy School on behalf of the Kennedy School. And if these aren't the two best behaved kids in Massachusetts, I, I just don't know. Uh, and last but not least, let me introduce the, the Kennedy School's Executive Dean, John Haig. Well, as Joe said, when you look out over the audience and you realize the hour of the day, you know, like he said, Bill would be sitting in the back going like this. But um, just a couple of things real quickly. I um, was here many years ago as a student, and then I got reincarnated a couple of years ago as the Executive Dean. And when I came back, it was interesting. I used to go in with David Elwood, the Dean, every Monday morning, and we would have some discussions about what was going on that week at the school. Now, many of you may wonder what the executive dean does, and at times, having watched the inner workings of Harvard for a while, I wonder that myself. Um, but basically, we would sit down and start going through the forum, and what's going to happen at the forum this week? And David would say, well, don't worry about it. Bill's got it. And then we'd come to another, well, don't worry about it. Bill's got it. Don't worry about it. Bill's got it. And the, uh, eventually I said, I really have to go meet this guy, Bill White, because he sure makes my life a lot easier. Because I knew I had some vague accountability for what was going on in the forum. So I went to meet Bill. And obviously, um, it's competence and it's skill and it's talent at making the forum work. But what I got to know with working with Bill over the last couple years is that fundamentally, he has so much commitment and so much passion to what happens in this forum. And he understands probably better than anybody that that's what we're really about. I mean, we are about dialogue, we are about debate, and we are about the fairness of the political process and the chance to express views. And he protects that and defends it and, and brings it forward better than anybody I know. And for that, I just want to say thank you, Bill. Now, I think we have a sure. short clip um, from David Elwood. David unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. He's had a long-standing commitment. Um, he is very sorry that he can't be here, um, but he did um, comment that um, he has a few words on kind of Bill's perspective on, quote, the dean. Um, so anyhow, um, here's David Elwood um, on behalf. I think everyone in this audience knows that the forum is obviously the premier place where extraordinary people come and talk at the Kennedy School. But it's actually the premier venue in many respects for Harvard University and one of the premier venues in the entire world. I think about the exceptional things that happen here. Um, this past semester alone, we've had three Nobel Peace Prize winners. And we've had a wide range of speakers ranging from left to right, from every different country, uh, the very controversial to the, to the very inspirational. And all of those things are managed with enormous grace by Bill White. It, uh, he comes to the, my office and we deal with each other with, a, with real regularity. Um, sometimes he comes and says, David, what do you think about this? And I can tell this is going to be a tough one. Or, gee, I'll say, well, how about such and such? And I'll say, well, that's maybe a good idea, but how about this? So it's a great, wonderful working relationship. Uh, just a couple of quick anecdotes. One of the things, if you ever watch when 
I am at least introducing, you may notice uh, eventually you'll need, see me nod like this. That just meant Bill held up two fingers. He says, two more questions. So those of you who think that you've been cut off, it's not me. Blame Bill. Um, last comment, I just really wish you a very, very happy and successful time in government. Uh, it's the highest calling and I'm, I'm thrilled that you're going to have the chance to work in the Patrick administration. I have only one request. Bill, in all the years we've worked together, I couldn't get you to stop calling me Dean. Well, from now on, try David. Very good luck to you. It's been a great pleasure. We're going to really miss you. Uh, Bill, we, we, we failed in one thing uh, this evening. We, we uh, made a purchase, but it's a six-week delivery schedule. But this is the, the picture. It's, it's a wonderful Kennedy rocker with a Kennedy, with the Harvard theme to it. So, do you have any, anything you want to comment? Please come forward. This is a little, uh, little embarrassing and a little overwhelming. The strange thing to know, though, is I didn't know this was going to happen. And I know uh, I got, um, you know, and I consider myself kind of a sharp guy. Um, and I, I got one email from somebody that said, you know, and sorry I can't come to the come to the shindig or whatever it was. So I'm like, what the hell's going on? But I really didn't think about it. And then, um, and then really the first thing that happened was I saw Brendan and Madeline and Jen uh, show up. And I'm like, oh, isn't that kind of nice that they came to my last forum? And then, of course, I see my dad walk in and my mom walk in. My, my four sisters are here, two over here, two over here. My two selectmen from the town of Milton are here. Um, and the one thing that you might not know, but, uh, oh, my best man is here. Chris Remus is here. Uh, my maid of honor is here, Carolyn Casey. I mean, it's, it's like an old reunion here. Um, and even the Coklas program came. Um, by, uh, by one little thought, though, about our, 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 my, my friends, uh, the two public servants on the front line in, in the, my great town of Milton. By the way, it's the seventh best town in America, according to Money Magazine, if anybody's looking for a house. Um, and I'm not even in the real estate business, but you, somebody was, we were talking earlier about this campaign, and um, our friends right here, uh, my selectmen, you know, they could practically win the Iowa caucus with the exact same amount of votes they get in the town of Milton. I mean, that, that's what we're talking about. It's staggering. So, you know, all power is local. Um, there's so much to say, and uh, I, was, uh, I, I got a kick out of all the remarks. Um, um, it's a little overwhelming, but I want to thank Jen. Um, we, uh, we, we, when we left Washington, um, well, when we first got married, and I said, oh, I'm just going to go to D.C. Just, you know, just for a short time, and we were there six years. And um, she was like, you know, I think it might be time to come back. And I knew it was time to come back because my family and her family were all based here. So um, this was the Kennedy School and coming to the Institute of Politics was a great landing. Uh, I want to recognize Joseph Justin McCarthy, who I often say is the most valuable player at the Kennedy School of Government as far as the way he keeps everything running. And he's cutting me <laughs> off. But my interview with Joe was... Um, you know, he started talking to me, he was asking me about my experience, and then he flipped over my resume to my page two in my education, and he saw Boston College, he says, oh, the hell with it, you're in. You're, you're, you're a BC guy. So that was fun. Um, uh, Samantha's remarks, um, it was so funny because when we, when she was talking about the time we were at Yankee Stadium, you would just only off a year, we were there 2003 together. It was game six, and we had won. And the strange thing to know is like we were, I was in my full regalia, Red Sox regalia, and my friend who got me the ticket, who was a Yankee fan, said, Bill, don't wear anything Red Sox. I'm not going to defend you. You're not going to be my friend. And of course I did, but I, I made it. But on the way into the stadium, I, out of 55,000 crazy Yankee fans, I, I see Samantha Power with her Red, so Red Sox hat. And then on the way out, I see Samantha Power. With her. I mean, it was just weird. And then, of course, we talked about the game, and everybody around us is listening to us, kind of snarling at us, because we went through every play. We were so damn excited. <laughs> um, I am, uh, I'm, thrilled, um, I'm thrilled to be moving on. Um, I have loved being the forum director for the last eight years. Uh, I'm excited to go work for Governor Patrick. Uh, I'm going to go work for um, 
uh, a guy, a great guy by the name of Ian Bowles, who's the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, and I'm going to be doing the federal relations portfolio there. So it's going to be th it's going to be thrilling. But the forum, and you know, David Pryor when he said the word soar, that's what it's all about to get this place to soar. And um, you know, the tough part of the job is we get bombarded because Harvard. I mean, we're living we're living the life right here. Uh, it is we have the best of everything, and they. The, just the content and the caliber of expertise, just from the faculty that you, you, you heard tonight, but also from everybody around the world that wants to speak here. It is amazing, it's amazing, it's overwhelming. But never take it for granted. Uh, the forum is, is probably, I often say, as you guys have heard me say, other than the White House and the Great Hall of the United Nations, there's no other, no other venue that offers this kind of uh, dialogue. And you know, you get those sound bites on TV, but this is so real and authentic and uh, I've loved it. I've loved it passionately. I, I thank John Hag for his words because I do. I feel very, very passionate. I want every event to be great. I want every event to soar. Uh, I want authenticity. I try to keep people brief. I wasn't responsible for the Gorbachev 90-minute remarks. Um, but um, it has been a ball. I see all my students that have from years past in the here. I mean, today we went out and we had a lunch with them all and they, we reviewed the semester and I will miss them terribly. And uh, I thank them for all that they've given me and Jen and our kids. So that's all. I will thank you very, very much. And I look forward to coming back. All the best. And, and finally, I got I to gotta embarrass Jim Leach one more time, though, because he, 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 um, he's, a, he's a statesman. He's a, just a, a class act. I mean, I watched him tonight in the forum. And uh, he's got such an intensity and a brilliance that makes him a great leader of the IOP, and I hope he stays for a long time. All the best. Thank you. Well, the uh, icing on the cake is in the back room. Uh, we do have a, a cake and refreshments for everyone that's here. We thank you all for coming, and we thank Bill for his public service. Thank you. Thank you.